The good thing about the la being last talk is that you can continue as much as you want. So, <laughs> oh, thank you for coming, everyone. Oh, there was a, there was something inside this, so I couldn't set it up. So uh, this is a joint work with uh, Matt Jackson. If you don't know him, here is him. Uh, he was my advisor at Stanford, and now my colleague. Uh, let me start. Uh, I don't have to convince you that diffusion in networks is important. Diffusion of ideas, innovations, infections, and uh, information, we try hard to have eyes all over the place, happens through networks. And understanding dynamics of diffusion is important for making policies. Now, in, in many diffusion situations, uh, we are dealing with time varying networks, meaning that the time scale of the evolution of the network is at the same uh, level of the time scale of the evolution of the process. And in those environments, the timing of interactions can matter a lot in, in a speed and scale of diffusion. Let me show you a very simple example, I mean somewhat an obvious example. Uh, suppose uh, I'm uh, Mohammed, I mean I'm, I'm a green professor at Stanford or assistant professor and there is Matt who is a blue professor at Stanford. Uh, we live in a Stanford campus and once in a while we go to office. Uh, in expectation we go to office two to three times a week. Now I have a secret that I'm going to tell to Matt if I meet him this week, otherwise it's going to be relevant. Now it's Monday, it could be the case that I decide to go to work but Matt decides to stay at home, I'm going to call me active in this period and Matt inactive. So we're not going to talk because of this miscoordination. On Tuesday, Matt decides to work. I decide to I mean, stay at home and uh, just rest. Then we're not going to talk. In the next day, we have both work one day per week. So we are happy we're going to stay at home. And we're not going to talk again. And finally, on Thursday, there is a theory seminar at Stanford. Or uh, there, is a, there is a launch seminar. So we're going to go uh, to work and we're going to talk. So you could easily see I could construct this example in a way that uh, you uh, I mean, we don't meet this week in a way that we meet on Monday. But this shows that actually timing of interactions, the way we actually decide to, to, to work or decide to be active in this social network is actually something that matters about speed of diffusion and scale of diffusion. In particular, a key question we have to answer is how a node or link's behavior today depends on its past behavior. Okay, and the standard assumption in this, this environment is Poisson. I mean, every day, if you are active 50% of the days, every day you toss a coin, you're active 50% of the days. But there is, I mean, the body of uh, evidence that real world, in, when you look at the behavior of people in social networks in real world, they are actually serially correlated. So if you and I meet today, or if I'm active today, it's very likely that you and I meet for a sequence of times. I mean, Scott is here. I mean, I meet him once, and then I meet him for a long time, and then I don't meet him for six months, and then again we meet. So we have this serially correlated behavior. And what I mean by serial correlation is basically if you look at the activity patterns for Poisson, so on, it's going to be something like active, not active, active, not active, and so on. Something that you see for a bursty behavior or a serially correlated behavior, it's going to look like something like this. So active for a while. I mean, not active for a while, and so on. And then there are so many papers, in particular in physics literature, and uh, uh, some papers in computer science that actually show that this, this actually hurts the diffusion substantially. So it changed the time that it takes for a, for a network to be informed about something substantially. Uh, increase increases that time substantially. So it's, it's hurtful for diffusion. If you're thinking about flu, it's actually helpful because it stops the flu. Now, uh, I, I, try, I, mean, I try to do a simulation and test these results on x axis here. You have the fraction of nodes in a network with Poisson behavior. So I have a social network, in this case an Erdogan random graph with too many nodes. And zero means everyone is bursty, serially correlated. One means everyone is Poisson. And on the y-axis, you have the probability of a full diffusion. And the diffusion model is that I hit someone with flu in day one. I let the process just grow for a few days. Everyone, if you are contagious and you're active and your neighbors are active, you're going to infect them. And the process continues. And if you look at this probability here, you can see that actually bursty behavior substantially hurts the diffusion. That's, that's just confirming what we already knew. So here, the probability is uh, something like four times less if everyone is bursty versus everyone everyone is Poisson. Now, I mean, there is a big assumption here. You, have, you, have, you, have, you should have been able to notice, but by, by the way, I actually have this graph here, which is that I'm assuming that 
either everyone is naughty, uh, either everyone is Bercy, or everyone is Poisson. And this was great if actually uh, this, this function here was a monotone function increasing. But let's do the following intellectual exercise. And by the way, this is slide, once you know that, you know what happens in the paper. I mean, so, so that's, that's basically everything about the result, which is here I start with everyone Bercy in this social network, and then I pick one, one, one node at random and make that node Poisson and then measure the same thing. What is the probability that everyone is informed? Then here, I mean two nodes, three nodes, up to the, up to the last point when everyone is Poisson. And then I look at this probability, and when I do that, you can see that this is actually completely non-uniform. Okay, so once you pick some, once you have something like 40% of the nodes behaving in a bursty fashion, the rest Poisson, the diffusion is three times more likely than when everyone is Poisson. Okay, and, and this, this between case is, is something that, I mean, we couldn't find in the literature, so we tried to write down a simple model to uh, just understand why this happens in an intuitive fashion, and that's the rest of this talk. So, uh, the model is simple. Uh, you have a social network, a bunch of nodes, a bunch of links, uh, time passes in discrete periods, and this is the new piece of the model. I'm going to uh, assume that agents, nodes of this network, are, are either active or inactive every period, and I'm going to kill heterogeneity in uh, how much you're active. Everyone is active in expectation for lambda percent of the days. That's because I'm going to focus on heterogeneity in timing of activities. Now, your activity follows a Markov chain. If you're active, you're going to remain active with probability 1 minus Q. You're going to be inactive with probability Q. And if you are inactive, you have probability P of becoming active, and then probability 1 minus P of remaining active. So this can help me. This simple framework can help me to model Poisson behavior, serially correlated behavior, negatively correlated behavior, or positively correlated behavior. Uh, it's, it's easy to see that I have to satisfy this balance equation. I mean, the, in expectation, you're going to be active for lambda periods. So lambda times the probability that I move from the left side of the cot to the right should be equal to the 1 minus lambda times this probability. So I have two degrees of freedom. If you give me lambda and q, I know what is p. Now, let's think about some canonical and benchmark uh, cases of behavior, Poisson. For a Poisson agent, the probability of being active is independent of the past. So 1 minus Q is equal to P is equal to lambda. Okay, that's just Poisson behavior. Now I could have an extremely bursty agent, which I'm going to call a sticky agent. These sticky agents, in the first period of the simulation, I toss a coin with probability lambda they are active, with probability 1 minus lambda they are inactive, and they stay in that state forever. Okay, this is just extremely positive autocorrelation. Uh, and then I have reversing agents who have extremely negative autocorrelation. So they have the maximum possible change switching in their states. A simple example with lambda equal to one half. Uh, this is Poisson. Uh, sticky agents with probability half, they are always active. With probability half, they are always inactive. And these reversing agents are active, inactive, active, inactive, and switching states. Okay, these are just some uh, three canonical cases. You can think about in between cases too. Now, diffusion uh, protocol is the famous SIR model. For those of you who don't know, it's uh, quite standard and simple. I infect one node and one agent in this network. Everyone is susceptible. Then uh, once an agent gets infected, they remain infected forever, meaning that they're not going to be infected again. It's think of flu. And you are contagious for cap T periods. Okay, for the cap T periods, if I'm active and, I see, and Nicole is active and we see each other in the network, uh, I'm going to actually transmit this flu to Nicole. And finally, uh, yeah, that's basically an agent who is contagious is going to send the send the uh, infection to the to a neighbor in the network if and only if both of them are active in the same period. Good. So let's see. Uh, what happens. So the question I'm going to ask is how does the likelihood of a full diffusion or I mean expected number of people who get infected as, as two measures depends on the activity patterns and which patterns enhance diffusion and which patterns uh, hurt diffusion. And for that and in order to make everything so simple for this last talk of the evening let's focus on a line network because it gives us all the intuition that we need to see what happens with bursty agents. So I start with the first agent in this line network getting infected, and that agent state starts at random. 
Then I have this chain, and I want to see what is the optimal structure, what a structure of agent, if I only focus on Poisson and sticky notes. What is the optimal structure of agents? Do I want to have all Poisson? Do I want to have all sticky? Do I want to mix them in a specific way? Do I want to alternate, or, or what's the optimal structure? And by, by, by considering optimal structure, I don't mean that there's a mechanism designer who is I mean, thinking about I mean, what is the optimal structure. This is a way for me to think about uh, whether or not Percy behavior enhances diffusion. And if that's the case, why? So, so that's, the, that's the intellectual exercise. And it turns out to be the case that there are two threshold values of lambda, average activity patterns. For, for I mean, very small values of lambda, you want to have the first and the last nodes to be Poisson, and everyone in between is sticky. And note that these sticky agents with probability one minus lambda are off, they are not there. And the measure I'm looking at is the probability that everyone gets the infection. Yeah, start with the first node. I want to see what is the chance that everyone gets the infection. If any of if any of these sticky nodes is off and they are not active, which happens with probability one minus lambda, I mean I'm going to miss that. But still, I want to have a sticky agents in between. And then uh, for intermediate values of lambda, I want to have alternating Poisson is sticky, Poisson is sticky. That's the optimal structure. And if lambda is sufficiently large, I want to have everyone to be Poisson. There was a qu question. Does T feature in this result at all or not? You have T, the time before recovery, right? Uh, yeah, T is the how many days you're contagious and send the, send the flu. So here, uh, I'm, 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 I'm assuming T is some number, but lambda is a function of T. The lambda stars are functions of T. But you get this structure for any T? Yeah, this is this structure except infinity, in which case you want to have everyone person. Yeah. So, uh, so let me just uh, try to uh, prove uh, the basic idea. Uh, th so, so the proof has three steps. The first and second, I'm not going to actually go through because of time, but they're very simple. Uh, it's easy to prove that you always want the first agent and the last agent to be Poisson. Okay, so let's, let's forget, and it, it's beyond line networks. Whenever you infect someone, you want that agent to be Poisson in any general network. Now, the interesting case is in between. So suppose, actually, I'm going to focus on three nodes. I start from a Poisson agent getting infected. I have someone in between and a Poisson node at the end. I have two choices, Poisson or Sticky. If I have a Poisson in between, then the probability of a full diffusion is equal to the probability that this Poisson node sends the infection to the middle. I'm going to call that probability PP, a Poisson to a Poisson, times the probability that another Poisson node sends the infection to the last Poisson. That's the same PP, so it's PP squared. If the middle is sticky, that probability would be PS times SP, the probability that the Poisson node sends the infection to a sticky node, the probability that the just a sticky infected node sends the infection to a Poisson. So it's PS times SP. Now I can calculate these probabilities explicitly. What is PP, the probability that a Poisson node sends the infection to another one? I need both of them to be active in the same period. That's a lambda squared probability. And I want this to happen for one of the T periods that I'm contagious. Okay, so that's simple. Now, if you do the same thing for PS, I want the S stick, I want the sticky node to be active. That's probability lambda. And then if it's active, it, it's active forever. And then I have another term, which is the term uh, that I want the Poisson node to be active in one of those T periods that the sticky node was active and contagious. Okay, so this is just the probability, and if you, may, if you look at that, that's less than PP. So a sticky node are actually pretty bad receivers. They are very, if, if you want to just send the infection to the next person, you don't want to have the sticky nodes in between. They are very bad receivers. But if you calculate SP, what is the chance that a just infected sticky node sends the infection to a Poisson agent, then that probability is actually going to be this object, because a just infected sticky node is going to be active forever. So I'm not worried about the lambda term that I had here. So I only have this term, and this is more than PP. So sticky notes, conditional on getting the infection, are very good senders. They, they play the role of intermediaries. And if you write down these probabilities, uh, you can actually do the math and realize that for some threshold value of lambda smaller than that, 
this gain from sending advantage outweighs the cost of actually uh, receiving this advantage. And this threshold is actually not very small for, for this case of three nodes, uh, lambda star is, and t equals two lambda star is 0.75. So if you're active on average less than 75% of the days, you want to have a sticky node in between. Now, let me just tell you one comparative static. Give me any lambda, any average activity pattern, and a star network. This is just an idea for you to show at which positions in the network you want to have sticky nodes. So if you have a star network and give me any lambda, I can find a sufficiently large star for which you always want the center, center of this uh, star to be a sticky node. Okay, so basically, as you increase my number of neighbors, it's very important, it's it become more and more useful for me to be a sticky because I'm a very good sender. So I can intermediate in this network. Now, uh, so far, all the results were, thanks, all the results were uh, qualitative. If you do simulations, uh, you can see that actually the magnitudes by, so this is a comparison between alternating and Poisson. The magnitudes are actually of the order of, uh, an order of magnitude, magnitude higher. So if you have all alternating structure versus Poisson, uh, I cut it at four, but it goes up to 10. So you are 10 times more likely to have a full diffusion. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, serious effect in some sense. Now for general networks, I don't have much time, but once you have cycles, everything becomes difficult. Of course, if you have random graphs and uh, they are sparse, they are similar to trees, so you can extend the results of a line to trees and then to random graphs, but, but you have, once you have general graphs, you have cycles, everything becomes intractable, but you can always do simulations. And, uh, or you can do this simple theorem, which is that Think of any network and any general type of agent beyond Poisson and Sticky and reversing. I start by infecting some node, which is not leaf. We need that for some technical point. Then the any configuration that maximizes the probability of diffusion is always non-homogeneous. So you always want to actually mix different types of people. I can't tell you what types of people exactly in a general network, but we can prove that there is no structure which is homogeneous and maximizes this probability. So that's as much we can go for a, for a general network result, and you can always do uh, simulations like this and show that actually, so this is for a, I mean, a network with, with cycles, the same graph that I showed you at the beginning. So the question that we tried to solve and we couldn't is this, uh, this, this optimal burst, if you like, question. You have a network, you have K nodes that you can convince them to behave in a sticky fashion or in an intermediate fashion. In, in, in the sense that they are always on or they are sticky, they are always on with some probability lambda, and you have k of them, which ones you want to actually have as your optimal uh, intermediary points or optimal burst in this network. Uh, I, I haven't been able to solve this problem, so I propose it as an open problem. Uh, bursty behavior can help uh, diffusion for the, for the intuition that you see because they are actually very good senders and you want to use them in key junctures. And, uh, there are some uh, extensions you can uh, apply. I think I'm out of time, so if there is any uh, questions, I would be happy to answer. <laughs>